Lee Keith has been doing the daggone thing. So we'll be right back with B. Keith Fulton, who is the chairman and CEO of Solify Productions. We'll be right back. Just a second. Okay, thank you. B. Keith Fulton, chairman and CEO of Soldify Productions, is an award-winning filmmaker and author of 11 books, including the popular Mr. Business, an eight-book children's series, and the amazing Amazon top seller, The Tale of the Tea, National Nonfiction Book Award winner in the, um, in the children's series. He founded Soldify Productions, a full feature film, stage, and TV investment and production company designed to promote a more inclusive narrative in major media. Soldify produced four feature length films in 2018, four, a first in the history of independent cinema, River Runs Red, Atone, One Angry Black Man, and Love Dot. Com. The Social Experiment. Soldify also co-produced a bi biopic on the legendary Sheriff Bass Reeves titled Hell on the Border. Distribution sold of, oh my, I'm sorry. Distribution partners include Lionsgate, Freestyle Digital Media, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Gravitas Ventures, and Urban Home in Entertainment. The company's first stage production, Thoughts of a Colored Man, released on Broadway in 2022, is the first Broadway production in history to feature an all-African-American male writer, director, and cast. Reviews have been glowing with one publication noting that Thoughts is the most important play of the 21st century. Soldify also publishes Soul Vision magazine and owns Soul Vision TV delivering over 500 hours of positive and inspirational streaming television via Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Roku tablets, smart TVs, and all mobile phones worldwide. In 2022, the company will release two new films, two novels, and pre-show. The first app in the world that will allow members to enjoy gaming, media and theatrical entertainment for free. We're going to stop here and bring in B. Keith Fulton to talk about that. You know what? I, <laughs> let me just say, so this is a lot. I don't know how you must have a team of 9,000 and, and Mrs. Fulton is right there by your side, making it happen. This is wonderful. And, and this is just the beginning. So I didn't want to waste time just reading this amazing <laughs> bio, but um, anybody who is subscribing to the newsletter, the bios in the newsletter, if you're not subscribing, make sure that you send it to WKIMmedianetwork.com. Marsha Jews at Gmail, then we'll get it to you because it's got all his information. But I want to talk to him because we got a whole hour for him to talk about all these aspects. Hey, BK, what's hey, good? Hey, 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 how you doing, Marsha? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've known him at least a little while. For so, a minute. For a minute. For a minute. So, so, how Can you, you see me? All right, you got my good side. I see you. Mm -hmm, you do it all that. Yeah, mm -hmm, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the movie business. We got to make know, sure we pop it and block it. And, and the lighting's all right. You know, Lighting's we got it right. all right. Look, I got this yeah. little circular thing happening. I know, I know, I know. Did you have a little music coming on your coming? <laughs> 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 I'm so proud of you, man. Thank you. Okay, so we met, I think you were at the National Urban League back then, running yes. everything. Yes. And look at you now. This How about is, that? Started I'm, from the bottom, now we're here. You didn't start at the bottom, boy. Don't even try it, cause when there wasn't at the Urban League, I met you when you were at AOL. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So that goes way back, right? It, it does. Right, it does. cause that yeah. was when Larry Irving was over at Comcast at, 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 uh, at Commerce Department of Commerce. That's right, the Undersecretary. Yep. Yeah. So there you go. Let's talk about this journey, right? Okay. Because you've done big corporate work. Let's talk about some of the corporate work that you have done. So Time Warner, Verizon, we've already mentioned that, the National Urban League, the one, the headquarters. And 
And so you go from this to all this creative side. I mean, and, and you didn't just go to <laughs> you didn't just go to the creative side like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm gonna paint some little something up. You said I'm going to do feature films and I want to go on Broadway. Right. How'd you make this huge transition? What happened? Let's start from back in the day. You were born and you for what was going on in your world for you to have this panoramic view. Uh, because you're t really talking left and right brain kind of guy, right? Right, right, right. Uh, both my parents are educators. My dad's a math teacher, uh, retired. My mom's an English teacher, retired. And they always kind of poured into me that I could do whatever I wanted to do, that I could do whatever I was willing to work for. Mm -hmm. um, I started my first business when I was 10 years old with my parents' support. And I couldn't drive. I had a landscaping business. So how are you going to get to customers' jobs and you can't even drive? Well, I got my dad to give me a ride and I used his equipment, took some of his customers, and they played along. And so throughout the experience growing up in Hampton, Virginia, and Newport News, Virginia, there were books. There was um, a, a, a way to explore my curiosity. Um, my writings were encouraged. So my mom has produced stuff that uh, I wrote when I was five and six years old. And so I wrote a story about a bunny rabbit when I was like in, in kindergarten or something like that. And she kept that and sent it to me recently. And so what ends up happening though, when you grow up in that rich environment, you develop a, a level of resilience, confidence, tenacity, and curiosity mm -hmm. that can serve a lifetime. And for me, you know, it's not always been a crystal stare, but even at moments when I've been uncertain, I knew that if I could find the right kind of mentor or the right kind of book or the right kind of resource, I didn't have to uh, reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. I could learn from what other people did and then get out of whatever I was into and build on um, the learning to become the best version of myself. And so what you see now, vice what you saw when we were you know, much younger, is a person who's just continuously learned and kept applying myself and reinventing myself. And um, I'm having a ball. But you're reinventing yourself in, in the most extraordinary ways, right? So you're not just going out for like the little ice cream stand on the corner you're really going into corporate so you clearly were doing an analysis of sorts where you were in all of these corporations getting a real understanding of what how to how to make all that work right well, let, me, let me let me tell you this because it might surprise people that the the success for me didn't really start in the corporate world the six the success in the corporate world was an outgrowth of finding as the previous author, a previous guest talked about that, that joy in being who you are and becoming your authentic self. So I found the black joy in the library and here's the deal. So I was, um, I was at engineering school at Virginia tech right. and I was flunking out. Marcia, I was dancing. I was playing basketball. Not I, was you. Doing, I was doing everything except what I was supposed to do and flunking out fast. I started getting these, nasty grams from the registrar. Mr. Fulton, you're going to be on probation, blah, 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 blah. And so I literally went to the library to plan my escape from Virginia Tech. Okay. And I found myself in the E185.5 section of the Dewey Decimal System. Now in the Dewey Decimal System, the E185.5 section is the section on black folk. So I think it was God that put me there. It was a big old library. And that's the section I ended up in. And, you know, divine serendipity is what happens when God puts you in proximity with the people or institutions you need to meet or work with to give love a chance. Mm. And so I found myself in the E185.5 and I'm reading about Lewis Latimer and Granville T. Woods and Elijah McCoy. And I'm like, wait a minute, they invented lights and electric third rail. And, and when we say the real McCoy, we're talking about a brother. I didn't know that. And so that put rocket fuel into my experience 
as a college student. And so I literally went from the probations list to the dean's list to the board of directors of the university. I was flying in a jet to go and govern the institution. So, you know, it's like free your mind and your ass will follow. Mm -hmm. And so it was those books, Mm -hmm. those books that freed my mind. It told me that I could do anything. And here's the picture, here's the patent, here's the proof. And so it wasn't making it up. It's just the stories that we don't get. And we need to read the right books, need to read the right stories. That's why I applaud your show. You're bringing on people that's pouring life and love into our community. And once a person embraces who they are, with all the confidence that we know we're capable of, because we're all wonderful and divinely made, then it's something to see. Watch out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I love it. And so for me, then, fast forward, creating the the movie business or the, the, the media empire was me trying to tell these stories and get more of these stories to more people. Because if reading about them could change my life, then if I could put it on the big screen and put it with great acting and great music and great scripts, I might be able to change it to multitudes. And so that's what we're trying to do. But it's it's not uh, without some pain going through this, right? Because you got to navigate all of the pieces that are in the way. So you did that. You went through that process. You stood in what, EX, whatever it was. E185.5. E185.5. I'm, that needs to be a logo somewhere. <laughs> really, you shouldn't think about that. But Okay. But it's really important and we were talking earlier that you know reading is a passion of mine i'm that i'm that girl with the 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 bookmobile right mm-hmm. but how do you now in looking at all that you're doing i mean you just hit the hit the broad hit the the a movie just came out with folks who are top liners talk about this movie because you've you've made this leap And you've been making these steps along the way. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I can do this without being just so blatant. But I just don't know how else to do. (laughs) Well, be blatant. Be you. Don't worry about it. Okay, so BK BK is a principal with Ralph Sampson in Winner's Circle Ventures. A $100 million strategic investment company targeting women and minorities. Prior to becoming a full-time author... And media entrepreneur, BK was vice president of the Mid-Atlantic region, Virginia, Maryland, D.C., and Delaware for Verizon Communications. Uh, with That was a $5 billion revenue base and president of Verizon Virginia and West Virginia. And then he was, has held leadership media technology and policy development posts with the U.S. Department of Commerce, AOL, Time Warner, Verizon, Fios TV and founder of Community Studio and the National Urban League, first MPO in the world to broadcast a conference over the internet. BK is also so BK is also an inventor, easy reader, an investor, a philanthropist, and he's considered one of the most influential African Americans in technology. His thought-leading papers on technology, media, and community building are permanently archived at the Smithsonian Institute. He is trained as an intellectual property lawyer and serves on the boards of Norfolk State University, Town Bank, Air Wireless, Preshow.co, Virginians for Reconciliation, the Joan Trumpar Mulholland Foundation, Library of Virginia Foundation, the Lewis Latimer House of um, Museum and Media Mentors, the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, Boone Castle Media and Entertainment, and MediaU.com, the first global online film school with UC Systems transcripts. He's the chairman of seven companies, seven companies. Uh, including Soul Vision TV, Aero Technologies, Emeritus, Body Snatchers Productions, Encrypted Sensors, um, e- Encrypted Grid, and founding editor of Soul Vision Magazine, a member of, oh, I didn't know you were Q, Omega Sci-Fi, 
the Ooh. Da Vinci, yeah, <laughs> Da Vinci Center Angel Advisory Board, the Pure Genesis Advisory Board, the Global Advisory Board of Education for sharing E45, the Executive Leadership Council, and the Boule. He holds a bachelor's degree in urban affairs. Um, uh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. And planning with two years of computer engineering and architecture at Virginia Tech, a master's of science degree in Sloan Fellowship uh -oh, in management and policy analyst, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and the New School's Milano School of Management and Policy Analysis and a Juris Doctorate in Intellectual Property, Electronic Commerce and Telecommunications Law New York Law School, and he's the father of twin boys and is married to Jacqueline E. Stone Esquire. And you can go to solidif solify dot so, so, solidify solidify That's s o u l i d i f l y dot com. You got it. You got it. This is a lot, but I want you all to go up online and go to his website so that you can see the whole expanse of everything that he's doing. Which is, I need to get a teleprompter so I don't have to look at these little tiny words. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. Yeah. In looking at, at these big dreams that you had and then you brought them to fruition, how did you start bringing them together to be able to get them to market? What Write was, them down. What does that mean? Write it down. Write it down. Vision so, when, so when I was in, after I had that experience in the library, I call it my awakening. I then went and wrote a 60 year plan. Mm. And just like I read about those great heroes and sheroes, I looked up additional people that I respected and used their life as a blueprint. So I studied Ron Brown, Vernon Jordan, Mary Ann Spragans, Dick Parsons. And I took the common denominators of their experiences and I made them part of this blueprint, my plan. And I figured I would do what they did until I knew how to do better. Then I'd add my own scaffolding, my own dreams to fill out my blueprint. And so for the last 40 years, I've been following my plan mm -hmm. and it works. When you have a plan written down, then things come up. Life is dynamic. <coughs> Bless you. Life, mm -hmm. life is dynamic and things will come up. So I would weigh all opportunities against my blueprint. And if it didn't help my blueprint, I didn't even consider it. If it helped my blueprint, I would consider it. You don't always do everything that's presented to you, but at least, you know, if it pushes along the right trajectory, then you can consider it. And so that's how I was able to navigate and keep going forward and up. And then by following these lives already well lived, I knew that if I do everything they did, I had a chance. You see, what I try to tell people is this, the win is in the work. God blesses all of us to turn our dreams and ideas into their tangible equivalents. But you have to have the faith, be willing to do the work and expect the outcome. And then the magic happens. I, um, I mentor a lot of young people and I go to a lot of conferences and, and they say, well, hey, why are you working so hard? You retired. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm retired from one job, but I'm doing some other things now. I'm really doing what I want to do. And so I, you might get an email from me two, three o'clock in the morning. And they said, but if you retire, why are you sending emails at two or three o'clock in the morning? And then I tell them, I work while you sleep so I can live like you dream. And they're like, oh, and then there's always somebody in smarty pants say, well, 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 you can't be having no fun because I'll never see you at the club. And I was like, well, au contraire, I'm having a lot of fun. By the way, I never see you at the bank. Boom, drop the mic. Then they began to get it because life is about having fun, but it's also being, uh, it's also about being productive and being able to create something that allows you the freedom to create more and to spend more time with the people you love and the people you admire. You know, I do a lot of things. Part of it is to show people that we don't have to be in any particular box. On the cover of my last book, which won the Nonfiction National Book Award, is a Dr. George Grant. 
and he invented the golf tee. The name of the book is called Tale of the Tee. He also was the first black professor at Harvard and was a dentist. Our ancestors, if you look back, have always done many things and done them well. And we can do many things and do it well. You know, sometimes I get worried about folk who don't have these stories that I know because then the least little obstacle they run into, it shuts them down. And what I want them to know is that when our ancestors were doing what they were doing, those amazing things, they had the whole world stacked against them. No civil rights, couldn't go to the bank and get loan, couldn't travel in a state, couldn't even go to the bathroom in some places. And they still achieve. We are the Steph Curry, LeBron James, Michael Jordan of resilience and tenacity. All of us. We, that's the DNA we carry. And so when you start tapping into it, the magic happens. I do these things and more because I know who I am. Readers become leaders. Y'all better go get the right books. That's really interesting, though, is that too often we don't even see what we can do. We don't see ourselves there because it seems bigger than what that that dream seems bigger than what this looks like right here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and having to take that step, the step for you was being in that aisle and seeing people who look like you at a time that wasn't popular for them mm -hmm. to even mm -hmm. think about, let alone make it happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But that seems to have been this um, this new little spirit that got lo locked in to yours. Right. Absolutely. That kept you moving up that path. Now, when and the other day when we were on the phone, you were talking about you were going to go and talk to the kids about the books. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, so let's talk about that because you know you have Bruce Willis on your latest movie. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. But now we're at the school with the kids and the books. So right. I want to. I want. I want you to talk about the school and the kids with the books. So today I was reading to about fifty children in Richmond, and I read my latest children's book called Video Games. Um, it's a book about when I was going to run away. And I packed my bags because my mom wouldn't let me play video games and made me come home to eat. And then they sent me to send me to my room and I was upset. So I was going to run away and I packed my video game and my controllers and my skateboard. And <laughs> and then had this heavy suitcase and I went to the backyard and looked, and I saw this field and this road. I ain't know where the airport was at. I was like, man. And I turned around and looked back at the house and I saw the dog, my dog Rusty. And I saw my bicycle, and I saw the, the encyclopedias my parents had bought for me. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going, but I don't know if they have any of the stuff that I like. I may want to stay here. <laughs> and so I stayed here. So the kids and I, we, got, we, we had a little fun with it. And um, But the book, it's called um, The Adventures of, 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 of uh, little BK, Mr. Business, The Adventures of Little BK. And it's about my life when I was uh, young, like about third grade. And so it's, you know, books about wearing glasses or the first day of school or somebody calling you something that's not nice and how to respond to it, um, appropriate touch. So I, I, I deal with a lot of important issues, but in a kind of fun way. Um, one of the other things kind of that, that's important about the, the series is that it's always you know a little BK on the cover, a little brown boy, and you know statistically only about three percent of books have a child of color on them on the cover, and so you, you a, a, a black child, a brown child is more likely to see a dog, a cat, a rabbit, or a humanoid on a book than to see themselves. But the research says that when children can see themselves as characters or on covers or in the pages of books, they're like twice to five times more likely to believe they can accomplish what the characters accomplish in the book. And so at the end of the day, representation is critically important. And there weren't a lot of books for children 
especially brown and black children that showed them winning right. regularly. Mm -hmm. And I make sure the books are inclusive, but Mr. B, Mr. Business, Little BK is always on the cover and there's always these clues about what's in the book. And then the book always ends with something and then a little quote or something at the end that's about love or a value or a principle. And so families love them. I had this one grandfather and he bought the first book and, and started reading it to his uh, grandson. And the grandson took the book and said, that's me, that's me, I'm gonna I read this. And it. the grandfather took it back and the boy took it again and started reading the book and said, I'm gonna read this to my friends. That's me, mm -hmm. I'm Mr. Business. Mm -hmm. And it was the most beautiful thing. So the grandfather drove to Richmond to see me because he was mm -hmm. just so impressed at the way his, his, his grandson gravitated towards it. He hadn't really, uh, really fully appreciated the importance of the imagery right. until he had that reaction from his child. Right. And so we get that consistently. So we know we're off to, to on the right track. We've actually partnered with Lion Forge Animation. They won an Oscar for Hair Love. Um, and we are partnered with them to do some, uh, a cartoon version of Mr. Business, maybe for Disney or maybe for Netflix or a company like that, a big distributor. Uh, so stay tuned. But um, we are excited about that, that series. And then we also wrote a middle school reader called Life in the Middle for kids that are, are um, ready for more challenging words and vocabulary and plots. And so we have that book as well. And uh, we partnered with UPenn, which is the number one graduate school of education in the, in the world. And they do a free curriculum so that if you're homeschooling or if you're at a, a public school or a private school, you can not only get the books, but also get a free curriculum to help you with mm -hmm. writing, help the kids with... Uh, understanding what's in the book and journaling as well. So we're really excited about that. So are you, this is a whole series. Yes. Right. Yes. And um, where can we buy those? Uh, everywhere you buy books, Amazon okay. in particular, uh, they're also on audible. So people want to be read to, and then they're also on caribou.com and caribou is the number one video read sharing app on uh you know, on Apple and on the internet. And it's also free for veterans. So if you're a veteran, uh, you can get Caribou for free and get all the books. And then you can literally read to a young person from anywhere, even if you're in another country. Oh, so that's, that's the beauty that's the beauty of Caribou. That's wonderful. So this would be for people who are already serving our nation elsewhere and they yep. could still have this experience with their child. Yeah, oh, exactly. Well, where did you come up with that idea? I love it. I'm a genius. I know you are. <laughs> I didn't know you would say it out loud, but I'm sure that everybody already knew that. Because <laughs> you are a left and a right and then a front and a back brain, too. I mean, hey, look, I'm all over the place. I know, I'm just, I know, I'm, I'm, I know. I'm just, I'm, you know what it is? I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy. It's <laughs> like when I was listening to the, the author and talking about Black Joy. I mean, Black Joy is beautiful, ain't it? It's real. It's, it's luxurious. Real. I mean, you can tell when somebody happy. You can tell when somebody ain't happy. Mm -hmm. But I, I like I like it when black folk feel good. When we feel good, man, it, it, we make it rain on everybody. I mean, not like bad rain, like good rain, money oh, or right. joy. Positive. Right. I live every day rejoicing. You know, it's like when when I when I was younger. When you're young, you know, your appreciation of the wind and the breeze has to do with it with its ability to provide lift to your kite for example. Mm -hmm. So you understand nature in that way. But then when you get our age, I ain't gonna say how old we are. No. You get our age, your appreciation for the breeze is just in the fact that it blows. Mm -hmm. And you know it's a, you're alive. And you woke up this morning. And so joy started right there. So everything else is extra gravy. Everything else. So every day I wake up, it's an opportunity to do something. I... I'm a person, somebody get around me and they all, all so sad. Or I, I don't like being around them people. I say, all right, bye. You know, I need people to lift me up because I'm that kind of person. I mean, my my, my spouse does that for me. My, my my little Jackie, I call her. She, I got a little, all kind of nicknames. None of y'all business. I ain't gonna tell y'all what the yeah, nickname is. Yeah, I, I ain't getting into that. That's a whole nother conversation. That's a different show. <laughs> different show, right? 
but 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 it, it matters though when you got when you have the right people around you, the right, right. partner with you, mm-hmm. and the right mindset. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that you cannot do, mm-hmm. and I don't say that as a kind of axiom, as some kind of platitude to sound nice or whatever. It's real. It is real. It's real. And it is real in that, you know, too often we surround ourselves with people that we think that we can trust that really have our best interests at heart. But too often they're not even interested in your betterment. It's all about them. You know, it's all about them and what they want, they need, they feel. Joyce Meyer says that all the time. And we have to really think about who we have in our circle of influence. It's called a circle of influence for a reason, for us to be able to learn, to grow, to give, to be. It can't be this insular expectation with people that you already know. If people show you who they are, believe them. Believe them. The first time. Right, right. Not not the second or the third time. Oh, they did that again last time. The first time. Yeah, yeah, right? agree. 100%. So when you look at your circle of influence, right? Yeah, okay. And I heard a few names that I recognize. Yeah. But when we have young people coming, we have young people who are watching this, parents are watching this with their families, I mean, with their kids. How do we, what are, what are four things that you see um, that seem to have a void that need, people need to pay, put their attention and with intentional intentionality, right? Their attention and the intentionality behind that. We were talking earlier about the black joy, black love, black, all of these things. But through all this madness that we see on television, how do we navigate that to the point where people can be comfortable with their children being prepared to grow and to be the best that they can of themselves. Sure. I don't know if it's four things, but okay. I know I know that one of the things is pouring love into the people that you care for. And part of the way you do that is with your time. Mm. And especially kids are really curious and they need our caring adults to be in their lives. Um, it is my view that sharing stories, especially early on, of us achieving and winning is critically important for building character and, 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 and building the, the defense mechanisms, but also the offense mechanisms so that our children know how to succeed. Because again, there's very little that's new under the sun. And so what you have to do, though, is expose folk to the blueprints or the, the remedies or the ways to make or get to one's best life. You know, you can, you know, if you're around a lot of folk and, and, and it's always complaining, you're probably gonna be a complainer if you take on those mindsets. If you're around someone that's always sad, you're probably gonna be a though today so miserable kind of person. And so we've got to reprogram ourselves. I, I, I used to collect cars and I remember I had this fancy, um, European car, and this guy pulled up on me at the gas station and said, well, is that what I think it is? I was like, well, it depends on what you think it is. He's like, is that a Bentley? I was like, it is. He's like, man, how do I get one of those? And I'm like, go to school and go to work. He was like, just like that? I was like, just like that. He's like, man, I ain't never think about that. Nobody ever told me that. I was like, well, that might be why you don't have one, you know, but you can get one. Because your grades in school was probably better than mine. And see, that blows their mind. Because when people see the, 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 the end result, they assume all A's, went to the best this and the best that, grew up with a silver spoon and all that. Man, ain't had none of that. Mm-hmm. None of that. You know, almost flunked out of college. Kind of struggled a little bit in high school. Could have done better, but I was under that thing where, you know, you want to act white as if white folk have a moratorium on intelligence. Nonsense. Mm. But again, it's because you're reading the wrong books, taking in the wrong information. I didn't know my ancestors built the pyramids. I didn't know my ancestors invented the third rail. I didn't know my ancestors invented lawnmowers, potato chips, forced heat, 
did coding for NASA. I didn't know all that stuff. So then when I started learning that stuff, I had a little different, little, little, little pep in my step. When I rode the subway in New York in graduate school, I was like, this is my subway. My people built this job. <laughs> you take on a different attitude, you know? And so I want more of our young people and some grown folks too, right. to, to know more about who they are. So, so pouring in that love and, and helping, to, helping them to develop a love for self that includes a curiosity, that includes reading, that includes reaching out to the next generation. Because, you know, I created my company not because I needed to make movies. I created it because I believe I needed to share these stories in an impactful way. And media is one of the most powerful tools that human beings have at their disposal. And so I said, if I can use this powerful medium right. to infiltrate a confused mind, then I will have done what I believe is my assignment here on this earth. I think that's a, a very strong, strong statement because too often, you know what, when I grew up and I keep talking about South Bend, Indiana, East Side, right? Everybody knew everybody and they knew who lived in what house and you know, we, it, we just knew, right? And and you also knew that you could only behave in, in a certain manner and without being punished forever, right? But how do we today in 2022 have parents looking at the reality of the impact that they give to the children by doing what we are talking about now? How do we get that mindset that this is, mandated. This is our whole thing. This is our whole life, our our life. I know that I too often I wasn't where I needed to be as a parent, right? And doing what I needed to do, not even knowing what I didn't know, because I didn't know what I didn't know. And so how do we really go about getting parents creating this parental movement in taking that time to to help develop this next generation. Sure. I, mean, huge. I, 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 th I think we've got to enlist the help of our ecumenical community. So our, our churches need to uh, you know, preach it from the pulpit and encourage folk to read books. We need to create traditions around uh, book lists for the summer, book lists throughout the year, continuous education. We need to tell the stories of our successes. Let me, let, me, let me give you an example. Okay. So you heard of Mozart and Beethoven and all that, right? What if I told you that the champion fencer in all of Europe in the late 1700s was a brother? Not only was he the champion fencer, he was also a virtuoso on the violin. Mm. Marie Antoinette asked him to head the Symphony of France. Mozart went to France to learn from the greats. Sh Joseph Balloon Chabaye de Saint-Georges was the greatest. What if I told you that Saint-Georges created a legion of a thousand mixed race and African swashbucklers to fight for France and to protect him? One of his lieutenants was T. Alexander Dumas, father of Alexander Dumas, who would go on to write The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers. So let me summarize. summarize the cornerstones of French literature, influencer of Mozart and virtuoso on the violin, prodigy, and the current on guard stance in fencing, all from the same brother that most people know nothing about. At all. At all. And these you heard are, it here. Th these are the kinds of stories mm -hmm. that we have to start telling our children. Mm -hmm. You don't think iconography is important, stories are important? Why do you think they fought so hard to keep them old crazy Confederate monuments up? Why do you think they fight so hard to keep Christopher Columbus up even though he ain't never hit America? At all. But what they want to do, because it's important, they'll, some people are lying, say, look, we did this, we did that, even if you didn't do it. We could tell the truth. <laughs> and empower our children. Period, and the other thing our is, children. Our children. And, and the cool thing is, it's not just for our children. The more people know about it, the more they end up respecting our humanity.
-hmm. You know, but what happens is we've digested and ingested this lie and allowed it to inculcate our being. Mm -hmm. So all the things you described I'm doing, seven companies, running this, running that. I wouldn't have been able to do that if my mind was had been had remained limited by the things I was taught with the traditional school system. Mm -hmm. I had to seek out myself these resources and books and these different kinds of people. I had to go sit down with Nikki Giovanni. She wrote the cover uh, quote on the back of my first book. But once I started getting that right medicine, I got mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. and I got free. Mm -hmm. A mind once stretched by a new idea never returns to its original dimension. What we have to do is pour these new ideas into our young people and love them enough to teach them who we are and who our ancestors were. We didn't you know, start out in, in humanity as slaves. We were builders and writers and, and hunters and farmers and created languages. And that stuff is lost to too many. Yep. It's like we've got this, this, this long-term amnesia. But I had my awakening and I believe others will too. And so in the tradition of uplift cinema that predates me, I mean, the, one of the early film companies was the Frederick Douglass Film Company. A lot of people assume the Lincoln Film Company was the first one. I think that was formed in 1916. The Frederick Douglass Film Company was formed in 1915, right after the birth of a nation as a response to that, because that movie was racist. It painted us a certain way. And what this one um, doctor out of New Jersey said was, I didn't want that image to be the prevailing image of black people. Right. So he created a film. His first movie, he did four movies. One was um, A Black Lawyer Wins His Case. Another one was this documentary on World War I, which is probably one of the best World War I documentaries ever. And, um, but he made these films. And then Oscar Michaud went on to become the grandfather of black cinema and did over 40 films, I think like 44 films. And, um, and actually, Virginia was the center of black cinema for a time when Oscar was in Roanoke, Virginia. I think really? for six, six years. Yeah. And so it's all this wonderful history that we have access to. And um, as we access it, more of us will be liberated and we will do more to lift ourselves, our own communities and other communities. Because I do believe we've got to pay it forward. And, and the stuff we're trying to teach is not just teaching black folk, it's teaching human beings, it's teaching yeah. everybody. Because right. these stories are our stories, they're everybody's story. And you're right. The issue is, is making sure that people really understand that they're everybody's stories. One mm -hmm. of the things that I think, um, and, and this is keeping with having that information and having our history and being able to access that history um, on the internet and having that capacity. So you are already here, but we're gonna bring it forward to how do we now in 2022 with all the madness that we've dealt with, with this COVID-19, right? I, I'm gonna go back to the fact that we still have a digital divide. And a lot of the young people that we want to see your work, to read your work, don't have access to be able to do that. And you have a broader view. You're at, you know, you're looking at that, that level where you can see the landscape, right? How do we as a community across this nation deal with the fact that our children could be on the internet buying your books, reading about your books, but they don't have that access? Let's talk about the digital divide in 2022 for a minute, if you don't mind. Okay. Because right. well, I you... know you've got a real, well, you've got the history there. So. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with the quite a few people, including, including the person that coined the term, the digital divide, Larry yeah. Irving, yeah, and uh, followed him at the Department of Commerce. And then he, he's still a dear friend and was a, 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 an advisor for, for, for many years. He's always been a mentor, love Larry. He continues to fight the good fight. Um, but definitely making sure that everybody has access to the tools of their time. You know, there was a period when we were growing up where probably encyclopedias was the, the, the big way to show that you cared about 
the knowledge and stuff like that. And every black folk would were working two or three jobs to get them damn encyclopedias. I had them right there. Yeah, right there, you know, they did it. And uh, and so you, you went through that phase and it was getting the computer and then getting the internet. And then what you started discovering was some communities were getting left out. And so they didn't have the same access to jobs or the same access to information, et cetera. And so I think that what we have to do is, you know, leverage these phones, leverage the, the iPads, leverage the, the, the digital watches. Um, well, I mentioned the ecumenical community is, is important. I think working with uh, some of the traditional groups like urban leagues, NAACPs, other community programs, um, those are the places where we can get to our young people and then just make sure that the books in there, the programs in there, the people doing the teaching uh, have a sense of this knowledge. I, you know, some people say each one teach one. I've never been a champion of that because it's, it's not a growth strategy. Mm. If I teach one, when I go, that one means it's just, you know, we're, we're, we're staying. May level. or may not. Right. We're, yeah. We're not growing, but if each one teaches many of you can, if you can do 10 and I can get five, then all of a sudden when you and I check out, we got, you know, we've, what 13 to the good. And so we've got to, we got to multiply. We can't just die. We got to multiply. Mm -hmm. I don't know who would have said baby's kids. We don't die. We multiply. And so we got to have a baby right. kids approach. That's right. To community enhancement, community engagement. And we all have to spend time and people got to get in where they fit in. So some people better just get money. Um, some people need to, can, can, don't have the resources, but they can show up with the time and volunteering. Human beings, we're, we're kind of we're, we're tangible creatures, and so we need people to be to engage with us. And here's the beauty of it: so, so human beings retain about ten percent of what they uh, see, fifty percent of what they see and hear, and eighty percent of what they see, hear, and do. Mm -hmm. So when we engage people and give them that experience, then they more likely to retain it and be able to pass it forward. And so, you know, you do media, so mentor and media. I do media and business, so I mentor media and business. And, and, and then so folk don't have to get out of their comfort zone per se. In fact, it's my belief that um, each one of us should do the things we love and from time to time invite in somebody we don't usually do that thing with. That's how you bring other communities in. So if you like fishing, your neighbor like fishing, and y'all don't get together much, go fishing. You know, you like Dolly Parton and she like Dolly Parton, go to see Dolly. You like, you know, Lil Nas or 50 Cent, go see 50, go see Snoop, whatever it is. Right. You know, and before you know it, the assumptions about others, the other, start to wash away because you fill in those assumptions with experience-based knowledge and truths, and then let in hearing from them. And before you know it, you create this ecosystem of support and mutual respect. And we've got to start with ourselves with that. Too often you go in a place and I've been in places and it ain't been the person who don't look like me that's giving me the drama. It's the person that look like me. And it's a crazy thing. What is that called? I don't know what color struck some people call it, but I don't know. But it it it, it ain't nice. And why does I, that happen? I think it happens because you know what they say: familiarity breeds contempt. Mm. And so you 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 assume that you know you can do act a certain way, be a certain way with people from the same community. And it's fine if that's a positive, it's fine if that's built in respect and uplift, but it's not fine if you feel like it's your opportunity to take out whatever microaggression or frustration on your brother or your sister. That ain't cool. I think it's also, I think it's very interesting that you brought that up because, you know, it. I don't understand the fact that we all have melanin in our skin. We, we all have melanin in our skin. We all have melanin. I don't, 
there's a, there's a rainbow of melanin right in that skin mm -hmm. tone mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, even if you are passing to get what you want, at some point, somebody's going to know. Mm -hmm. And and then the reality of what that pretense is about is going to be even deeper in what you thought you could manage that you will not be able to manage. Mm -hmm. If you are, if the lid is off, then you've got to now deal with a circumstance that you don't even know how to deal with. And I know several people who are like that, that have lived their lives a lot, a lie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, sometimes it's hard dealing with situations where um, your authentic self is not appreciated. Mm -hmm. And so people do what, what you're describing as passing and some people do that. Um, some people, you know, you, you hear kids talking about acting white and stuff like that. So what, what I what I try to do is not spend too much time dealing with those things. They're real things. But what I try to do instead is figure out where I want somebody to go and then what's the building blocks or scaffolding to get them there. So that's why I tell people to pick three or four people that they respect and then see what they did on their journey to success and follow what they did. So that way I don't get into all the peculiarities of a human, of a live human person. And it's dynamic. I mean, what, what's your upbringing? What was your neighborhood? What's the, what, what's the vibe where you, and your faith tradition? Do you have a faith tradition? I mean, it's a whole lot of things that impact who we right. are and who right. we become. Um, but when I tell a young person to pick people they respect, I don't hit the resistance if I spoon feed them my, my top three. You say, you pick your top three, but pick somebody who's done something. Up oh, note, pick somebody who's done something. And then you, you start looking at what they did and they finished high school. They made, they likely finished college. They worked in these kind of careers. Because then I put the challenge on because the challenge is this. And it's always the same answer. The win is in the work. Mm -hmm. You get to have the life you're willing to work for, you're willing to invest in. And so my, my kids are just you know, getting into a level of maturity now where I feel like a lot of the lessons that I tried to teach are starting to stick. And so I'm happy because I was wondering, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm so proud of them and everybody's either in school or working. So God is good. And um, so we all go through stuff and we, 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 we get, we get it at different times. And what I'm trying to do now is accelerate that, you know, um, now that I know more. And I'm actually going back, Marsha, and reading some books that I read when I was younger, but I'm reading them with 50-year-old eyes versus 20-year-old eyes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and more so than which, what, how old are the eyes, how mature is the brain? And so right. I'm reading them with a different level of maturity, so I'm picking up different insights. So when I reread the autobiography of Malcolm X or let the trumpet sound about Dr. King, I can appreciate their walk differently in the iteration of myself that I am at this point. That's right. And, um, and so, you know, just got a new agent. And so I have a new book coming out later in the year called uh, Love's Insurrection. And that's, I like love. So it's a book about love. You had asked me about the movie. So the movie with Bruce Willis and Leon and Frank Grillo and Kevin Dillard is called uh, A Day to Die. We filmed it in Jackson, Mississippi, and um, uh, it's out in theaters, digital, and on demand. So if you have any kind of cable service, you just go to your on-demand menu, pull it right up. Also, Voodoo, and then uh, select theaters. If you go to the website that you have up there, solidify.com, click on films, all our movies and trailers and everything pops up. Um, you talked about uh, our stage production. So our first stage production was Thoughts of a Colored Man. Yeah. And it was the number one new show on Broadway. I mean, so if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. <laughs> so, we, so we came out swinging and um, had the good fortune to work with the illustrious Ron Simons from Simon Says Production. And Ron has like four Tonys. He's like more Tonys than any African-American alive. And so if you're going to jump into Broadway with somebody, go with the star. 
And uh, we've been fortunate enough to align ourselves with people who know what they're doing. We bring our own value. In our company, we've got uh, Monty Ross, who co-founded 40 Acres and a Mule with Spike Lee. We've got Keon Martin, who helped to found the original movie pass, also understudied under the late Joel Schumacher and Martin Scorsese. Uh, we got Nick Powell, who's an honor student from VCU, great writer. He does a lot of the writing for uh, our Soul Vision magazine. Um, and everywhere I go, I try to find talent and especially underappreciated talent. And then I pour into them to help them to be the best version of themselves and to show the world what they're working with. And it, it's, it's been a, a formula for success. Well, clearly a success. This is really wonderful. And, you know, I think too often we don't know where we're going, right? But life happens. And so all of these wonderful, incredible opportunities. Give me a couple of things that were like aha moments where you saw that there was a new trajectory that you were going to go in. Well, I mean, when when ABC, NBC, Nightline, CBS called about our show Thoughts of a Colored Man, and there was like an eight-minute special on Nightline on our show, I was like, wow, okay, okay, this is real stuff right here. This ain't play play. Um, when Deborah Roberts reached out after I did a commencement address talking about some of this history, and she said, you know, this is going viral. And then Maria Shriver reached out and they had me to write uh, something for her Sunday paper publication. Um, that was a, a moment uh, when we won the National Book Award for Tale of the Tea. And I co-wrote it with a Jewish author on purpose because I wanted to show the power of honest conversations to heal. Mm. And, you know, that was my first nonfiction book. And for it to win a National Book Award ain't too shabby. Not and all. so we're doing everything with a certain level of excellence. So what I've learned to tell people is to do great. Just be excellent out the box and do great things. And if for some reason you can't do great things, do small things in a great way. Mm, I like and that. Say that one more time. Do great things. And when you can't do great things, do small things in a great way. And, if, and, and when those, when those kind of ideas become your philosophy, it's hard to miss. You might miss some here or there, but if you always working and being excellent and doing your best, guess what? God and the ancestors show up and fill in the gaps. That's a beautiful thing about faith. And that's what living longer teaches you is that you don't have to have all the answers. You just got to show up and do your best. Mm -hmm. And then God and the ancestors pick up the rest. So we only have a couple of minutes left. Okay. And I'd like for you to um, give us some parting words about visioning and future and authenticity. Okay. I think one of the best things I can leave people with is to write down your dreams and ideas in a little plan, write it down and go to work. Mm -hmm. That will make all the difference. Don't just talk about it, be about it. The win is in the work. The win is in the work, right? Because you have to work. You can't just... You can't just sit around and wait for it You can't just. Yeah, you know? It's not coming in there. It's not coming. You're going to sit here just like this. Well, where is it? Right, right, right. Not happening. So, B. Keith, thank you so much for coming. And I want to know how long are we still going to be able to see the new movie that's out? It's out. And you said it's all on all on television, on cable, and all these other places. So, wait, one more time. Yes. Yeah, and so, that so, we can get so, videos. So, it's, so it's, in, it's in theaters, and it's on digital. And it's on all the cable platforms. So it'll be there for a while. So you'll be able to see it. You know, the theatrical run will probably be a few more weeks. And then, um, but the digital run and the on-demand run is pretty much evergreen. That's amazing. You have two big things going on at the same time. Broadway and in a theater near you, right? That's it. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I love it. <laughs> B. Keith Fulton, CEO and Chairman and CEO of Solidify Productions. Thank you so much for B. Keith for taking the time to come. I really appreciate it. And I'm so proud of you. It's just, you've just done wonderful things and you're changing how we see ourselves in the world. I appreciate that. And thank you for having me. Your show is healing and making a difference. So keep it up. Thank you, sir. We'll do. All right. Take care. You too now. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for watching. We were with B. Keith Fulton, and um, I'm just really excited about it. this. Has been a wonderful, wonderful show, and we're really tickled. I want you to go and get Black Joy uh, with Tracy Michael Lewis, Michael Lewis's Gidgets, and uh, we need to go to the movies and see. Uh, where we can, where you can go in your city to see Bruce Willis in that whole movie that's out now and um, Broadway. So go to Solify, uh, the, the website, and you'll be able to find everything that they have, all of the books. Thank you, Katanya. Solify, Solidify dot com and you'll see where all of his books, all of his movies, everything that he's been doing. And, um, I'm sure that you'll enjoy most of that. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Katanya Lester, our producer. And thank you, BlackUSA.News for all the stuff that we're doing here. And don't forget to watch us on www.stemcity.com. Oh, wait, it's stemcityusa.com. So thank you very much and hope that you'll come back again this time next week at seven o'clock on Tuesdays. Have a good evening. Bye.